seen an opening up of people on LinkedIn. It is interesting to see how the platform has changed. Um, like, have I done that myself? Like, when I was, when I left eHarmony, I didn't work for over a year. Um, I didn't, I, I don't know if it was pride or what it was, but I didn't want to put it out there and say, I'm out of work right now. I could use, you know, I was just doing the footwork every day to find my next gig. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. We use the word conversion in marketing a lot, but have you ever stopped for a moment and thought what it really means? It's changing from one state to another, from ice to water, or from agnostic to Jewish, or for marketers, from unknown to us to an email subscriber, and biggest of all, from not a customer to a customer. To make that conversion effort, customers need to understand the value on the other side. Why it's worth going through all that time and money to make that conversion. According to our next guest, one of the best ways to communicate that value is with authenticity. Real life success stories from real people. And she should know, she learned this lesson in her career trying to communicate about one of the most difficult conversions of all, finding real love. She's got some great lesson-filled stories for you today, and I'm so glad to welcome Jeannie Asimos, Head of Content and Communications for Way.com. Thanks for joining us, Jeannie. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> well, I had a lot of fun looking at your LinkedIn because you have an interesting background. <laughs> so you started as Managing Editor of Entertainment Tonight, and I joked, if we get like a Mary Harder John Tesh story <laughs> thrown in here, I'll, I'll, I'll appreciate that. Uh, you went on to be <laughs> Vice President of Content at eHarmony, a brand and content consultant at Jacoby and Myers, and now you are Head of Content and Communications for Way.com, where you manage a team of 20 people in India and the U.S., Way.com is a financial platform for cars with $200 million in forecasted annual revenue for 2022 and has served 6.5 million customers to date. So, Jeannie, what is your day like as head of content and communication for Way.com? My day begins early because half my team is in India. So before I'm even out of bed, I'm on the Teams, <laughs> the Teams app looking at all the messages and everything that I need to address and deal with for the day. Uh, so that's the very beginning, is early morning, jumping out of bed, walking my little min pin Johnny Cash. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Do you dress him in black? Of course. Okay. I mean, he's, yes, he's got the attitude, he's got it all. Um, and then, you know, sometimes running to the gym before office, it just depends if I've got morning meetings. Getting to the office, I feel like the first half of the day is sort of, okay, what do I need to accomplish today? Looking through everything, taking it all in, whether it's email or messages, and then executing uh, the rest of the day. You know, what is, what is the deadline today? What do I need to get done? What do I need to approve? Um, and there's so many moving parts of this company, you know, whether it's a PR um, situation I'm dealing with or a content plan or... Um, email marketing issue or SEO, you know, uh, strategy meet we need to have. There's a lot of different things going on. So it's never a dull moment. And um, it's been an awesome challenge for me after, you know, this long career that you speak of. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. like it's like new. It's, it's starting over in a way. So it's been and very And you mentioned cool. it's growing fast. That must keep everything changing every day. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's like throwing stuff against a wall to see what works. And it's kind of fun being part of a startup because you don't have, you know, all the layers of approval and um, that you would with like a traditional corporate, you know, where, like eHarmony or even Entertainment Tonight. Everything is sort of baked in and been around for so long. At Way, it's like, how about I try this? Go try it. See if it works. So that's kind of cool for me at this point in my career to be able to, to have the autonomy to do that. Very nice. Well, let's look back at your career, look at some of the things that you made and what we can learn from that. Um, as I say, you know, we as marketers, a really cool thing about the job. I've never been in another profession, an actuary or a periodontist or anything, but we make things. And that's, that's very cool mm -hmm. about what we do. And uh, so one of your first lessons is trust your instincts, right? So mm -hmm. tell us the story. How did you learn to trust your instincts? Well, I think... You know, after being at a company for a while, you, you know, you know the brand, right, inside and out. And you just get a, a sense for the brand and understanding your audience and who the customers are and 
That is so key to success, I feel like, in marketing. And a great example of this was I was working at eHarmony. We started to use, um, at a certain point, some actors in, in commercials. We had a lot of success with success couples, people who had found love on the site, but we pivoted to a different campaign, um, which was people in different scenarios saying, this is why I trust eHarmony. This is why I use eHarmony. Anyways, everybody wanted to use use all these young hot models for, the, for our commercials. And some of them worked. I, I did want to, them to feel real or relatable. And there was one, you know, I say he's older, he was probably about 50, um, guy that I had seen, uh, somebody who was coming through the auditions. And I really wanted, I just felt like he was relatable, he was handsome, but not too handsome. He was just a good fit for us. I just saw him and knew instinctively he'd be good for the brand. Everybody was arguing with me. You know, we tested everybody before to see, do people like this? Like, we had survey, um, surveys that would go out. Who, who do you like the best out of these five guys? He did okay, but I still was insistent we use him. And a long story short, we used him. It was the most successful spot of the campaign. And um, it may be even still running now. It ran several years and just, you know, performed amazingly. So, a you know, I'd been at eHarmony probably about eight years at that point, was working with a lot of people who were newer, and I just stuck to my guns. And, you know, of course you have to pick your battles, but that was when I just knew he was perfect. So, and it, and it worked. So, you know, it's hard to explain your instinct, but I just feel like when you really know a brand inside and out, you have to trust that, you know, trust yourself. So let me play devil's advocate for a second and get yeah. your thoughts here, right? Because in that story, yeah. you, you talk about, like, if that story was told from someone else at eHarmony, they would say, like, well, you know, they were wrong if they tried to trust their instincts to go with some of the other people. And you mentioned even, even questioning the data. So what are times when you feel like maybe mm. you need more data and you shouldn't trust your instincts as much, you know? Because I think of uh, an example... I interviewed, um, it was Aaron North, the CMO and commercial owner at Mint Mobile. And he mm -hmm. talked about earlier in his career, he, he worked at Taco Bell. And at Taco Bell, he realized the scale of the decisions he was making. Like, when he make a decision, have such huge scale. Like he even mentioned uh, when, when he was in the interview, he suggested, hey, why don't you have lobster tacos? And, and the interviewer was telling him there aren't enough lobsters in the ocean for Taco Bell to have lobster ocean. So anyway, he was, he was making the opposite pro, you know, problem. He was just overanalyzing everything. He couldn't trust himself. Yeah. And finally, a leader said, hey, look, you got you to gotta trust your instincts a little more. So, so if you're you know, giving advice to, you, know, you were there eight years, but you know, someone newer on your team, or you know, how do you balance that, hey, we have this gut feeling versus when should they go to analyze the data and trust the data more, test or whatever it is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because we were never a company that was about like testing and it was it was all instinct especially our, our ceo dr warren who's the founder of the company was all about instinct i just happened to know what's best for people um then we had a cmo her name was aaron Gian come on who was all about testing and data and, and quantitative qualitative research and at first i was a little bit resistant to it because i was like no 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 this is not how we do things we know we know this brand we know our customers but she sort of you know open my eyes a little bit to the value of the research and testing not only all the actors who are going to be in the spots, but the scenarios and even the, even the lines that we were writing, what is relating with people the best. And I think you have to just step back and you don't know everything, right? You never can. We're always learning. So to balance the two is really like the secret sauce to success, to trust, to look at, you know, what is performing and what, what is relating to people uh, along with your, it's just a blend, I would say, you know, so you kind of have to take both into consideration and not rely completely on data and not rely completely on your, you know, your instinct and your intuition. It's, it's a blend. Does that yeah, answer whenever, your question? <laughs> no, that's good. You know, I mean, I love how you challenge it. You just said, Hey, just because the data said this, I've got these, you know, I've been here eight years. I kind of get a sense for it. I, I, you know, I love that too. So I'm not trying to go against that. It is a great lesson, but because on the flip side, whenever I think of trusting the data specifically, it's like, I think there was an episode of the office where the GPS is like telling them to drive into a lake. So they drive into a <laughs> lake, right? And that, that's how sometimes I see marketers look at data. And so you have to bring so that true. humanity to it, right? Exactly. And these, you know, the research that we were doing was out of context too, right? Like you're seeing yeah. these lines, you're not seeing the whole picture here. So you have to take it with a grain of salt, right? Well, the other thing, you know, when we see, it depends what type of research we do, right? So I was yeah. working with, uh, um, we do these things uh, called value proposition workshops where we get like the kind of key players from a company and we get them in a room and we kind of work there and try to build their value proposition. And they were saying, um, just 
about the commercial they were running and just you know how great it was and stuff and kind of had questions and concerns about the commercial but they said no we tested it and did did really well and so basically the commercial was it was kind of very jokey it was about like this joke criminal trying to break into a house and then you know but he comes across their security technology and i was telling them like they were really were superior in some in some ways than some of the, the major competitors and if they showed that in the commercial maybe it would be more effective and like no 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 this tested really well it's test really well so then i asked how it tested and, you know, they focus grouped it, which a lot of people do with commercials. And I said, well, that makes sense. So, like, if, if I'm in a focus group watching a commercial, <laughs> like, it would be kind of boring to see, like, some really clear facts and stuff about, you know, this, um, you know, home security technology versus this very entertaining spot you made by it was a, a well-known director or something. It was some, like, trending, um, one of those kind of YouTube type of uh, mm -hmm. things are doing really well. So, I'm like, I get why it did well in the focus group. It's enjoyable, right? But then, like, is that, like, okay – my house got broken into last week and my wife's going to be alone because I'm traveling for a month on business and, you know, the police didn't show up fast enough and my neighbors say their house, are you know what I mean? Like that mindset yeah. of that person really needs to see the product. So when you're focus grouping too, it's good to get that outside perspective, but understanding one, is it the ideal customer? And two, are they at the point of a decision or are they at a mall and they're getting 50 bucks and Hey, that exactly. spot was entertaining. You have exactly right. Like maybe that one did well because all the other ones were so boring. Right? Yeah. So that one just did well as opposed to the other. Like how, but how often is a consumer going to be sitting at home watching five commercials for, you know, competing products? Never. Right. I mean, so yeah, you do have to weigh everything and not just be tunnel visioned. You know, you can't just go, okay, this is it. You really need to factor everything in and just look at it holistically. Well, so that was a, commercial that worked well at eHarmony, but I believe you also have a story to share about a commercial that failed. And you said the lesson you learned from this was keep it simple. So, so tell us this story. Um, yeah. So we had, we were working with a marketing agency who came in would pitch all these different ideas for commercial spots. We had brought our CEO back and put him all these in all these commercial different scenarios. Like we did one that did really well, speed dating where people are going around and then he comes and sits down and says, aren't you, isn't this exhausting? Just try eHarmony. That, that was a very successful commercial. So um, they pitched to us, um, you know, the, uh, the evolution of Dr. Warren. So starting as a young child, he was trying to match his little friends to be friends. Then when he was a teenager, he was matching kids at the dance. Like through his whole life, he's been matching people. And it was really, you know, we all were taken by it. Um, but the execution and the um, complexity of, you know, his going through his life stages in a 15 to 30 second spot, we, had, we would cut 30s and 15s, was just overly ambitious and didn't work at all. It just, no matter how they tried to cut it, it was just too much and it was just too complex to try to fit into a short, 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 short narrative. So, and you know, these days when people are watching TV, are they full, are they fully attentive? No, they're on their phones, they're on their, you know. So you've gotta keep your message simple uh, get to the point quickly. So that was a lesson, right? Like, let's not try these complex, you know, um, narratives and scenarios and keep it simpler. Somebody who's paying half attention will get the point. So that was, that was one, uh, yeah. It was fun to film it. It was fun to see the little Dr. Warren as a child, you know, in his little suit and tie. But yeah, it was a waste of a few million dollars, unfortunately. <laughs> But what a smart agency, right? They're like, I know we're going to appeal to the ego of the company's founder and CEO. Like, I know they, there was a strategy there for that agency, oh, yeah. I guarantee you. They were, they were brilliant. Yes, they were brilliant. <laughs> we fell yeah. for it too. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's a good reminder too. Like, nobody cares as much about our brand as we do, right? Like, oh my gosh, this Hall's documentary about our brand. Yes, let's, everyone wants to see that. But uh, yes. so, so have you ever used that? keep it simple mantra when it comes to written content and marketing because we have a, a free digital marketing course and in the session on headline examples flint mclaughlin teaches nouns form the substance of appeal and i love that lesson as a writer because when you think about nouns what are nouns they give us the clarity mm -hmm. versus throwing in all the adjectives and adverbs and it gets flowery and hype filled right you know but really focusing on those nouns so how do you use that kind of keep it simple mantra yeah, for your written content I mean, I write a lot of our product content, which is extremely important to be simple and concise. Um, so I'm always looking at everything through that lens. Like we're always launching new features in our app and 
Um, so I review all the content before, you know, the steps of uh, subscribing to something new, whether it be our roadside assistance or whatever. So always looking at everything through that lens. Um, you know, we have, uh, Way has a blog, which has a ton of awesome information, everything related to cars you could think of. That's a different format, right? That's just people are, you know, looking to learn something about whether it's registering uh, your car or oil changes or whatever. That's very different. But in terms of, um, I would say, the marketing of Way, in terms of new products, whether it's on the site or social media or writing a press release, it's very important for me to always be concise and clear and keep it simple. I feel like that's just the most effective way to to connect and for it to be digestible. Um, yeah, I hate, I, I think, I was thinking the other day, early on in my career, I was all about, you know, when I was writing and having fun, adjectives and just trying yeah. to be very <laughs> clever and kitschy, right, and all that. I kind of don't, that's very sparing these days, right? I don't, it, it's not about me and, you know, flossing my vocabulary. It's about, you know, just conveying what you need to convey simply and clearly. Yes, getting information across is a win. Yeah. Uh, the yes. other thing I thought about when I saw the Keep It Simple lesson is Way.com and that even, you know, the company name is a very simple name. And I wonder, like, what are the advantages and challenges of that for branding and for the URL? So, you know, for example, when I was searching to kind of do some background on you, it, there's definitely stuff you can find, but it's also a generic name, mm -hmm. so it's harder to find. We One of our publications is called Marketing Experiments, right? So when, when either I'm looking for social media mentions or a million other things where people are looking for us, for our parent organization, Mech Labs Institute, very easy to find. Marketing Sherpa, very easy to find. But Marketing Experiments, great URL, maybe great for Google because of that. But also it's kind of a generic term and so it's a little harder to stick out because you know, people use that yeah. generically. So I wonder if you had any tips around that from what you've learned at working at way.com. What are the advantages? What are the challenges of having just a very simple, also yeah. just very generic word as, as your company name and URL? In some ways, it's, a, it's, it's great, right? Because it's easy to remember. Way. Way.com. Yeah. You know? And we can do, have a lot of fun playing. You know, only one way to go. You know? <laughs> that, that's kind of fun in that regard. It's also challenging. It's challenging for me when I'm trying to look, what kind of coverage are we getting? What's going on? And you type in way and you see like, you know, that word used you know, 8,000 ways daily. So there are, there are challenges. There's pros to it as well. I wouldn't say I've like cracked the code on it, honestly. Um, you know, it is what it is. I know that uh, at one point Google came to us and tried to buy way.com like 10 million dollars or something. Yeah. <laughs> they said, nope, we're not, it's not for sale. So, you know, it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, I would say. It's difficult um, in some regards, but I think the benefit outweighs the negative just because it's simple and easy to remember. But yeah, it's, it's something that um, I'm still trying to sort of, you know, completely wrap my head around and work on. Yeah. And if anybody out there wants to buy it, it's going to take more than $10 million. So. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. <laughs> uh, so another lesson you had is authenticity works. So I was kind of hinting at this in the uh, opening of the show. How, did, how have you learned in your career that authenticity works? Um, I would say mainly, you know, when I was working entertainment, it doesn't really necessarily apply, but <laughs> it eHarmony, you know, what, um, you know, what that company became known for were the white psych ads. You know, I don't know if you remember the white psych ads where people were simple white background talking about how they found success on eHarmony. Um, they found the love of their life. Do you remember those? I do. We actually, <laughs> I looked back, we actually spoofed that back in, I think, 2009. <laughs> Because for Valentine's Day, um, we had like different people around the office talk about their favorite blog. And so we did it eHarmony style. And I think I named the article like, shall I compare CNNMoney.com to a summer's day or whatever? Because it was, it was such a simple and clean and easy style that everyone could get. So, yeah. I mean, no scripting, obviously. And um, just, you know, them being heartfelt and talking about their experience in an area that's so delicate for so many and frustrating and relatable to all of us, right? Finding love is not, is not easy. Um, so that was sort of my first um, foray and seeing how effective that was. And then we would, you know, we would veer off the path and try different things and say, no, we've got to do something else. And we hired some famous director and shot these beautiful scenes of people swimming, like in the swimming pool, hugging, like just all these beautifully shot scenes did not work. 
Uh, you know, we did some of the Dr. Warren in different situations I mentioned earlier. That worked pretty well, but nothing ever moved the needle and resonated like people sitting in a chair talking about how they found their person. So we did go back to that. And um, it just always worked the, better, the best, you know, whether it was digital, offline, whatever, it was always, um, you know, always the winner. So we always had to keep that in the mix. And sometimes we would, you know, thought, well, we got to appeal to different audiences. So we'll keep that, but we'll also do these different, um, more scripted spots. So we did, you know, we ended up sort of running a combination of both. That seemed to work well, too, to appeal to different, to different people. But um, even at Way, you know, when we've got... Um, you know, people, who, you know, on TikTok or whatever, we reach out and say, hey, yeah, shoot something. Just, you know, shoot something for us. And when they're just authentic and doing their thing and it's not scripted, and we're not telling them what to do, it just does better. It's always better when it's just real, when it's just off the cuff, when it's just me, you know, riffing or whatever, versus us saying, we really need you to promote our car insurance. We need you to, these are the lines. It doesn't work. We even have, we even... Um, What's the um, site where people, God, I can't think of it right now, um, where celebrities, you can, you know, they can send oh, a message Cameo. to your friend? Cameo. Cameo. Yeah, We're yeah. like, oh my God, Cameo for business. Let's try it. We got Lindsay Lohan talking about, you know, I only trust my love bug to way.com. We were so <laughs> excited. Okay. So excited about it. It wasn't exact, that exact line, but guess what? Did not perform. Did not. That was a waste of five grand. Did not perform. Um, kind of shocked people wouldn't trust Lindsay Lohan for financial advice. <laughs> I think that would be the kind of the first place I would go. Car, car services, you know. Cars are okay. <laughs> um, but we tried it with, you know, a, we tried it with the guy from, um, uh, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of them. And none of them did well. That's the bottom line. That's the headline of the story is that didn't work. So um, the guy from Cobra Kai, the bad guy didn't work so oh, yeah. we thought hey he's you know he's maybe Lindsay didn't work because you know no one cares about her anymore she's off in Greece getting married or whatever she's doing but Cobra Kai's a hot show right maybe that would work and John Kreese no did not work so again I just think people see through I don't know people see through you know script people see through um marketing you know marketing copy and just I, I feel like real it's just, just no substitute for real, realness. Do you have any tips for finding those stories? Because I know a lot of marketers struggle with like how to actually get the case studies, how to actually get those real testimonials. You know, as I mentioned, at Marketing Sherpa, we're publishing case studies all the time. They're not even testimonials about us or anything. They're just, you know, hey, here's what works in marketing, just as a publication. And those are really hard to find. We have the entire marketing universe to pull from, not even just you know, our own customers or anything. So do you have any tips? How, how did you find those eHarmony stories? How do you find those stories for way.com? It's a lot of work. I mean, the stories yeah. for way.com I mean, that's, it's different when it's like car services. And I, I feel like that's a little bit easier, but like Jacoby and Myers, for example, you know, it was a matter of talking to uh, a ton of clients and then finding somebody that was able to um, tell their story in a way that was, would resonate. So it's a lot of ground. I don't think there's like an easy path. I think it's, it's a lot of footwork, like for eHarmony. It was, it was flying all over the country, interviewing people in their living rooms, bring a, bringing a crew just so we could see how they would, you know, uh, perform, quote unquote, with a camera there, with the lights there. So it, there's no substitute for just doing the, the research and, and taking the time to find somebody who's able to tell your story, who's able to... Um, talk about your brand in a way that you know is, you know, and when you sit there and you talk to them and they're able to tell their story, like Jacoby and Myers, this one woman had lost her husband. It was horrible. Um, and at least they were able to get her compensation. And, you know, she was super grateful for just how, how caring the attorneys were, you know, just, she almost was tearing up. And then you just sit there and you go, okay, this is it. Like, this is exactly what the brand is going to want uh, to stand for. So, you know, when you have a winner, but it is work to get there. Jacoby and Myers, they do a lot of divorces too, right? No, they're personal oh, they injury. Do. Oh, are they? Oh, okay. Because I was thinking, did you have like both sides of the transaction, no. like eHarmony oh, and then divorces? So, okay. Uh, no. Well, I want to ask you about love because it seems like you're an expert on that matter. So, uh, you know, and this is something I've, I've been struggling with uh, lately. Like as a content creator, how far do you go in bringing yourself into your content? So as we were talking, you hosted a podcast for eHarmony. I think it was with the CEO. It's called The Love Show. It's about love. 
And I know, I mean, that's a really personal topic there. We're on more on the B2B side, but we've recently, I recently uh, ran a test. I called it authenticity versus professionalism, where we took our CEO, Flint McLaughlin, and one of them, he's in a cowboy hat in one video. He's from Montana, you know, that's who he is. And another one, he's in a suit. And, you know, I'm in a t-shirt right now. I was hoping authenticity when I thought definitely authenticity would win. This would be great. I could wear a Mets hat and, you know, everything <laughs> I do. But professionalism won, you know, a suit. I mean, obviously, we're a little more B2B. Um, that's something like struggle. So how do you decide like how much of yourself mm-hmm. as a content creator to bring into your content? How much did you bring into that love show? I mean, that's a really personal topic. Yeah. I, I mean, I was, that was always something that it was challenging for me was how much to bring in. And, you know, it, with, with the awareness that there was, you know, the, the guys that were dating probably listening. So, <laughs> I, so, I, so I always sort of, I was careful. I was careful, but I also wanted to bring value, you know, and I, and there's nothing more valuable than your own personal experiences. So, for example, people would, you know, write in, it was a weekly show where people write in with all their issues and we would discuss, and Grant, the CEO, myself, he was sort of had his perspective, I had mine, and I was dating at the time and dealing with things like ghosting online and dealing with things like people, you know, not being who say, they said they were, so I would talk about that. Um, you know, I wouldn't, maybe get super, super personal, but I would say it's happened to me. It happens to everyone. And you cannot take these things personally. If some, if you're talking to someone online and they disappear, they don't even know you don't take it personally, you know? So I would get pretty passionate about that and just trying to help people not feel rejection or not take it, you know, take it personally. Um, and also just, you know, just if I can educate and help someone that's really and share information that helps them, that's at the core. Like that's always what I wanted to do. Um, you know, share information that's helpful and benefit someone in their life. So I have to put myself out there a little bit. I'll do it. You know, it's something I've noticed on LinkedIn a lot too. I'm sure you have as well recently. The New York times did an article about this week about how LinkedIn has become such a more, not just business, but people sharing about all sorts of very personal things in their life. And yes. I see, you know, sometimes it gets a lot of engagement or sharing, but I also think, you know, I, I think there's like, you say, we were talking previously with the data, there's two things, there's a data and what works and there's what's right for you personally. And um, so I don't know, it's always something content creators have to play with me. Me personally, I'm a little more, definitely sometimes bring stories in, but I'm also a little cognizant of the fact that you know, it's not just me and you talking. It seems like it now. We're having a very intimate conversation. Mm-hmm. Other people are going to hear this. And on LinkedIn, too, it's not just people you know. You know what I mean? It's I not know. like just talking around the office. You don't know who's going to hear that. Someone you're dating, you don't know who's going to hear that. So it's an interesting topic. I think it's, I think it's brave and courageous to, you know, to share vulnerabil- vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, just with all the layoffs lately and people talking about their situation and even just... Yeah, I've seen I've seen the gamut. I've seen an opening up of people on LinkedIn. It is interesting to see how the platform has changed. Um, like, have I done that myself? Like, when I was when I left eHarmony, I didn't work for over a year. Um, I didn't. I, I don't know if it was pride or what it was, but I d- didn't want to put it out there and say I'm out of work right now. I could use, you know, I was just doing the footwork every day to find my next gig. But yeah, then I see people do that, and I think, oh, cool for them, but. I, I don't know if I'm comfortable doing that. So, you know, it's very interesting. And I'm happy to see that people are able to be more open. It's brave. I think it's brave. I think it's good. I think there's probably a good shift. Like, there's just a cultural shift, obviously, right? Yes. You see with all these reality shows and the Kardashians, and there's this kind of <laughs> understanding that maybe people can be in their lives. But I also think it's something you have to be careful for. Like, the, the, the trend I'm most a little uh, nervous about or unsure about where I see people do is when they're, you know, we talk about quiet quitting. Quiet quitting is something oh, that is um, is going. Yes. But th- there's this loud quitting too, where people are like, like the Jerry Maguire moment on LinkedIn. They'll be like, "I'm out of here," and this company sucked, and goodbye, fun, yeah. blah, blah blah. And I'm just thinking, it's it's not. I mean, there's one. I think it's a very robust economy now, a very robust uh, hiring market for marketers. So it may be easy to get another job, uh, but it might not always be that way. But the other thing is just always the idea of you know treating others with kindness and respect, even if. You know, th- there's going to be stuff that happened in your job where maybe the other party was wrong, your boss or the company, or maybe you also just don't have an entire understanding of the picture. And so deciding, like, what is appropriate to talk about in a public sphere, I just worry sometimes uh, things can swing too far in that other direction. Or it's like, you know what, that, that's maybe, that's maybe yeah. a private issue to deal with and not something we need to air out on. Um, on the, I actually got a pitch recently for, um, 
someone who works in an agency and they got burned by a client who didn't pay a bill, like from from their perspective, and wanted me to cover the story. And I'm, and you know, I'm open to it. That's that's a really good lesson for agencies to learn. But once you start sending stuff over, and I saw you know I saw the other side, I'm like, you know what, this is not this is not the public forum to air it in. This is you know there's. Yep. This is why you have a contract, there's courts or legal documents want people to learn. But, you know, there's cer- certain things that as much as we want to teach as, as much as we can on marketing Sherpa and this podcast, you know, there's certain things that's just that, that's, that steps over the line. So um, I agree. Yeah. And I think, too, like, you know, when you are, you know, let go from your job or something horrible happens, you're reacting, you're emotional. Like it's not yes. it's really not the time to share on a public forum. You should like wait. How about wait a month? And you may have a different perspective, right? Like, and at the end of the day, it's business. And I think some people forget, like, I'm in a business, things shift, and sometimes decisions have to be made. And um, yeah, like, you know, when I I was at eHarmony for over a decade, and eHarmony was acquired by a German company. And so the exec team, we were all, we sort of transitioned out. And that was tough, but I wasn't going to, you know, trash the company on on LinkedIn. I, I just, how would that serve me? You know, I have to look at, I, I always try to just look at the positive and be grateful that I had the experiences that I did. I got to work there for so many years and have an impact, positive impact. So I think, I, th- I think the lesson there is just don't react and just wait. Just like, you know, if you're angry at someone, how about just quiet, just be quiet, take it all in and, you know, talk about it in a few days once you've come back to your center. That's the best piece of advice. If it's, if it's a good idea now, See if it's a good idea a month from now. If it's still a good idea a month from now, go for it. But if not, you know, you saved yourself some uh, some hassle in your career, in your exactly. personal brand. Exactly. Uh, so the first half of the podcast, we talk about lessons you learned from the things you made. Now let's talk about lessons you learned from the people you collaborated with. Because we, we do two things as marketers, right? We build things and we build them with other people. So uh, your first lesson is adaptability is vital to your career, and you learned this from Grant Langston, the CEO of mm-hmm. eHarmony. How mm-hmm. did you learn this from Grant? He's one of my favorite people, let me just say that. I always say that. I always talk about it in interviews because he's had such impact on me. He started as, like, I think he was like a copy editor or assist, some sort of like intern in the broom closet at eHarmony when it first started out of Pasadena, Dr. Warren's, like, Uh, therapy office literally so he started there and just transitioned into whatever they needed I think he started writing copy and working on the commercials and maybe copy editing and then working on site copy and whatnot and he just you know went wherever was needed uh, through all the years there Uh, when I joined he was director of I think he was director in publishing department and um, he just had a gift of, with words and understanding the brand. And at the end of the day, he, was, he became CEO of the company. So, but one thing I always noticed about him was like, I'll, you, need me to, you need this role? Someone needs to step in and do this right now? Okay, I'll take it on I'll, and I'll figure it out. Even when he stepped into the CEO role, there was a lot he didn't know. He was definitely not a product guy or an engineering guy. But he figured it out. He worked with the teams and he just learned and listened and just the, fa- the fact that he could be so adaptable on this whole road, this whole path that he was on, and I watched that, um, was a great lesson for me because, you know, there's going to be a lot of times you, you join a company and then you're, things are going to change in the marketplace or with the company. And then you're going to be asked to maybe, you know, take this fork in the road and go this way. And you can either say, okay, yeah, I'll figure it out. And let's, you know, we've got a team here and we can do this. Or you can go, oh God, no, that's not what I was hired for. No, this is my <laughs> job description and I'm going to be rigid. Good luck. Because I just don't think, I've never seen that really work for people. I think you've got to be fluid and be open to, you know, a shift in your job or your job description. The more adaptable you can be in your job in your life, right? Go with the flow. Be adaptable to things that change. You know, the only constant is change. So I feel like that's just a great lesson overall in your life, and your life will just flow better and be easier and less stressful if you can adapt to change. Or, or just go on LinkedIn and complain about it. Like, hey, this is my job. <laughs> they asked me to do this other thing. How dare they? That's not my job description. Exactly. Um, but I think it ties into this other lesson, too, that adaptability, <laughs> tenacity. Tenacity, uh, we're talking. That's one of the top lessons I want to teach my kids, too. Uh, you learned about tenacity from Brad Bessie, the producer at Entertainment Tonight, or a producer at Entertainment Tonight. Yeah. How did you learn about uh, tenacity from Brad? 
I mean, on a daily basis. Like, so he would talk to publicists uh, for celebrities. And, um, you know, sometimes they would say, no, we can't go on, you know, the set of Tom Cruise's new movie. And then he'd call back the next day and say, I've got an angle. How about we, you know, cover the special effects? Or I've got this angle. Or in the case of Anna Nicole Smith, you know, we covered that, uh, her story from the time that, you know, she was in the Bahamas and all the crazy stuff was going on with her and just that whole saga. And we were sort of in the trenches and she unexpectedly passed away. And the next challenge was, okay, how do we c continue the story with Howard K. Stern, who was her partner, or Larry Burkhead, who was her boyfriend? Um, and there were a lot of no, 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 we don't, you know, we don't want to let the cameras into this, but it was, he was so tenacious and we want to continue to tell this story. Um, he just wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, he would, he would just, it was like, I'm going to make this happen somehow, some way. And he always did. Um, so I just think, you know, I, I think of when I started here with PR, it was like sending out cold emails to all these different outlets and, you know, no, getting lots of no's or getting lots of um, no answer, right? You just have to keep going every day. You have to get up and keep going and then you will eventually have success. Someone's going to say yes. Someone's going to listen to you. So I learned that firsthand from him and then have continued to practice that in my career. Yes, I agree. Tenacity is absolutely crucial. I feel that in my career too. But when people listening hear this, especially sales folks, even some marketing folks, I worry sometimes they hear the wrong lesson. So, um, you know, how do you combine storytelling with tenacity to get the people on the other end to on the other end to understand the value? Because sometimes they're saying no for good reason. And I'll give you an example, you know, I've had sales folks and <laughs> marketing folks they'll just come every day and ask me the same darn thing, you know, and that's not tenacious. That's just annoying. And and I was right. writing this um. Yeah, let me give you just one quote I heard. I love this quote, and then I want to hear what you think about uh, marketing storytelling. I was writing about marketing storytelling. I heard this quote from Jane Goodall, and she said, and talk about someone who is tenacious against seemingly impossible odds. You know? And she said, if I'm trying to change somebody who disagrees, I choose not to be holier than thou. You've got to reach the heart, and I do that through storytelling. So you, it seems like I've been a storyteller through your whole career. How does that play in? I mean, that definitely plays in. Um, and if the story, like, I think, like, in the case of sales and trying to sell a product, right, like, I think I'm not going to harass someone 10 times, you know, if you need this product for your company. If, if it's not the right time and they don't respond or they're not interested, then I'm going to tell the story to someone else who might be a better fit. So I don't, I don't mean, like, just hit the hammer on the same, you know, reaching out to the same people, but... Um, I think the more authentic you can be and, you know, the reason that, you know, your story is going to be helpful to someone else or, you know, you really need to, we want to bring this to life, whether it's, you know, I'm the theme of entertainment tonight and just, you know, we really want this to serve people. If you tell your story about your, I don't know, your past or your difficult, you know, your challenges, like I, I'm thinking about him talking to celebrities about sharing personal stories and how it could actually impact and help so many people. Like, I feel like when you're coming from a good place of like, this is going to help people and this is going to uh, be good for a business or be good for a person or be good for a society, like you have a lot more uh, chance to get the, to complete your mission, right? But I, I just think, um, I don't mean, you know, like b harassing people. I mean, you know, just getting up every day and, and, and trying to get your story out, but maybe it's to someone else and maybe it's in a different format. It's not, you know, some doors are going to close. That's okay. Then go knock on the door over here to the right. Not to, you know, not the same door. Don't break it down. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And it also sounds like what he did from what you're saying is he tried to see the value for that other individual as well, right? I mean, we, the value for ourselves is so obvious. And I'm sure being a producer of Entertainment Tonight, getting a big mm -hmm. get from Tom Cruise, wherever, that's the value mm -hmm. for ourselves. But how do you kind of put yourself in the other person's shoes and see the, yeah. the value for them as well? And that is what, you yeah. know, to your point, you need to add to that tenacity. Yep, exactly. Uh, so here, one last lesson. Make a U-turn when necessary. <laughs> you learned this from Neil Clark Warren, the founder of eHarmony. How did yes. you learn this from, from Neil? He would, he would say that a lot, you know, and, and he would talk about, he loved talking about relationships and uh, making you turns when you realize you've made a bad decision and maybe this isn't the right partner. And it's always better to make a U-turn and to keep going down the road. Um, but one project that comes to mind was we had launched a uh, career matching site called Elevated Careers. 
because we thought, God, we're so good at matching people for, with love. Like, let's match them with the right job. They'll be way happier. They spend, you know, 80%, you know, we have all these stats about how much time you spend at your job. And so we launched the site and had all these brilliant people working on it. And honestly, I don't know if we did like market research to find if there was interest, but it just did not do well. It didn't resonate. It didn't, um, it just completely flopped. And we worked on this thing for several years and just couldn't understand why the match, you know, the famous matchmakers at eHarmony could not succeed in another area of business and it just didn't work. So he pulled the plug on it. We made a U-turn. Um, we gave it time to sort of, you know, to try different messaging, to try different um, marketing efforts, uh, partnerships, whatnot. It just didn't work. So, you know, at the end of the day, we made, you, know, you tried it. And you, sometimes that happens in business. You're going to try a lot and fail. And you obviously learn, everybody says this, but it's kind of true. You learn more from your failures. Um, and then you can take that information and go try to launch something else. And that might work. It might not. But, you know, you got to try. So we tried. It didn't work. But making a U-turn is something. I just remember him sitting in his chair in his office and saying, got to make a U-turn. I mean, I, at the time I was in a marriage, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, uh, you know, going to last much longer, but he's like, it's time for you to make a U-turn, you know, and it's just, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we have a hard time admitting we're wrong, but we shouldn't, you know, we really shouldn't. We shouldn't judge ourselves. You just be smart enough to um, take a different course and to make that U-turn. Yeah, it's funny, but we just said that before you said about your marriage. I know you mentioned he's a therapist. It sounds like there's probably a lot to learn, too, from love and therapy and those things for marketing. Oh, God. Yes. Because, yeah, if we're in a relationship, sometimes you don't want to admit a failure and double down and you keep digging. And, but it's really probably just probably a step away. Yes. Um, you know, what? another thing when it comes to that story specifically and failure in general, it's if you don't fail sometimes, I think that's kind of a red flag because you haven't really pushed the envelope much, right? So mm-hmm. eHarmony probably at that point, you're probably pretty comfortable in a pretty comfortable position and didn't really have to do anything drastically different. But yeah. I mean, you would never have been able to reinvent the company or do these different things if you didn't try those kind of drastic actions. That would be my best guess. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there was always like, what else can we do? You know, what, how can we bring... Uh, this amazing, you know, patented <laughs> matching algorithm to other areas to help people. He really wanted to help people in all areas of their lives. So, um, so yeah, but, you know, at the end of the day, it was love, which is a very important area of your life that we, you know, could serve people the best in. We had, we had launched actually when Tinder came along and, um, you know, all the swiping sites, we launched a we launched one called Jazz, and it was another miserable U-turn. <laughs> that was a quick U-turn. <laughs> so we, st- we, we realized that we got to stick to what we do well, which is matching people for you know, long-term relationships. And you know, this is how we do it. This is what we do. And we're just going to stay in our lane. Well, that's a great lesson, too. There's so many companies that see a competitor, and they're like, oh, let's just, let's just copy them. Let's just, let's just yes. copy them. Versus understanding your unique value proposition and sticking to that. I remember... We had uh, we had an event called Marketing Sherpa Summit, and we have them every year. And, and I was talking to an attendee when we were leaving, and he's like, "Oh, this summit was great. It was so valuable to me." And I was like, "Oh, great!" And you know, I was in, I'm in charge of the content there, so I was expecting mm-hmm. him to talk about these great case studies. He's like, "Yeah, the case studies were great too, but here's what was really valuable to me. Like one night at the bar, I met you know the CMO for our biggest competitor, and I talked to him, you know, and got talking because we copy everything they do, and it wasn't working for us, and I couldn't figure it out. And I talked to him, and he's like, "Yeah, it's not working for us either." <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And so I think that's something you have to learn where it's like really, you know, finding your own unique value proposition, not just saying like, oh, this new upstart's doing this. We have to do this as well. Well, it's good to understand that upstart because your value is. proposition is affected by them, right? What's what's yes. unique, but don't don't just blindly follow them. That's like that's the other, you know, sort of you know, I think it's always an interesting balance to like with your business, you know focusing on doing your business really well and having a great product. Right? And not being so worried about what everybody else is doing, but you also need to know what everybody else is doing. So it's always that balance of, you know, what's what's new and innovative, and you know, I feel like that's an interesting conundrum that we fall into. Is like, okay, well, just, you don't want to be completely like, you know, laser focused on your business and not paying attention to what's happening in the industry, but you also really want to, you know, focus on doing what you do the best that you can do it. Before we get into the final question, it struck me as you spent all your time on this kind of relationship building and love. I wonder, 
if there's any lessons you learned, kind of like you hinted at that from love and from human relationships that you've really been able to apply to marketing, because at the end of the day, marketing is relationship building, right? Where we call it a CRM, right? There's relationships, there's, you know, building relationships with our customers. There's some sort of marriage they have with us when they buy our product mm-hmm. or our long-term customer. So is there any like kind of overlap that struck you one day between love <laughs> and marketing? Oh my God. Um, Hmm. That's a great, great question. I think I'd have to like write that out. Um, love and marketing. I, the, something that came to mind was, you know, um, if you can't love, you know, if you can't love yourself, you can't really love someone else, right? So, if you can't really believe in your business and really, you know, love your product, like, how are you going to do a great job marketing it? You, you know, you've got to really believe in what you're doing and get your business slash product, whatever it is, to a point where you truly are passionate about it and believe in it. Then you're going to do a much better job marketing it because you, you know, it's real. Does that make sense? Totally does. And I mean, I've heard marketers make that complaint sometimes where they didn't believe in the product. It's like, there's a lot of other companies to work for. (laughs) Don't spend your life toiling. Yeah. Don't spend your life toiling for some product that you don't think is good and trying to convince other people that it is because maybe you're right and maybe it's not. And then, you know, there's, there's a lot of other companies to work for. Or find Uh, a way to make it better. You know, uh, even yes, absolutely. Or find Mm -hmm. a way to make it better. I mean, that's key. So as a marketer, I've always felt we're making the brand promise out there, right? We're telling the world it's this thing. And so I've always felt a little guilt to make sure to be the advocate for the audience, the advocate for the customer to say like, okay, are we living up to that? And what, you know, having that relationship, having that intimacy with the customer to understand if we're living up to that and what we need to change to get there, right? Yeah. And don't stay, you know, you don't need to stay in your marketing box, right? Like I have, you know, when I was countless times in my career, I walked over and Harmony said, this feature, this product feature sucks. You know, this is not good. Like, you know, I mean... Maybe not in those words. You know, I would say it, you know, in a way that would be received better. But, um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, just don't be afraid to, you know, when you're marketing a product, like to um, be an advocate for the customer and say, hey, you know, this would actually make the project a lot better. Let's, let's talk about this. You know, you know, that's what we're all here for is to, to support this company and to be its best. So don't be afraid to, to blur the lines and talk to your coworkers about how that can happen. Absolutely. Well, we talked about a lot of different things that, that a marketer has to do these days, a lot of mark things you've done in your career. If you had to break it down, Jeannie, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? You know, I think understanding who your customer is, is so important. Um, and the other thing is, what does you know, what is this, what is this need? Or what, how do I say this? Um, understand who your customer is, what need is this serving? What problem are we solving? And um, taking yourself out of the equation. So I, you know, I was sitting in a meeting uh, with a bunch of coworkers who really loved this certain. Uh, this is Eddie Harmony, this certain, um, you know, person for a commercial. And I just thought to myself, um, this is not about this is not about the customer. You know, this is about you and your personally. So take your own stuff out of the equation and focus on the customer and what they need. Yeah. So absolutely. I've, you know, sometimes I've uh, heard designers complain about long copy. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, you know, I, they're like, I don't like long copy. I don't like long copy. It's like, well, you know what? If, if your refrigerator just broke <laughs> yeah. and then you come across this ad that has a lot of information about a new refrigerator, that's who cares about it, the customer. So it doesn't really matter if you don't. It doesn't work in the design. Think about yeah. the customer. So totally agree with that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Jeannie. I learned so much from you today. Thanks so much for <laughs> spending time with us. I, have a, I had a great time. I loved our conversation and it was... It was like deeper and more interesting than I thought. So it's been a great morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. Keeping it real. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I could over deliver. Hopefully, hopefully everyone listening had much higher expectations going in and felt like we, we hit those expectations. But glad we could over deliver. So. Thanks so. everyone for for tuning in and listening. <laughs> Thank. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.